I'll go ahead and get started. And, and uh, Charlie, you can wrangle people in if you want from yep. the outside. So no here, here's the book came out in April. So brand new book. Um, it was put together by Mark O'Donnell, who is the EOS visionary uh, running the show right now. And uh, he and I go way back um, when I think I was working with Quadrant before Zoe. So maybe five, six years ago, he stopped by my office and gave me about 40 books for traction. And so I pushed those out to our members at the time, which we had about 40 members. <laughs> I think that was it. My that's actually so I have one of those books, Dan. This is my oh my gosh, book, you're kidding! And it has the quadrant, it has the quadrant sticker oh, on the inside cover. Yeah, and Nate and Nate Roman was working with Mark, so he put yeah. his thing in there. That's great! Wow, right? Oh, it's got Nicole's yeah. email address on it. Oh gosh. Anyway, I'm sure that's how ago. Eric got it. Probably. So, so he kept moving, and uh, now he's a visionary uh, overseeing. 2,000 implementers globally and hundreds, uh, or I should say tens of thousands of companies probably um, that are implementing traction. So it's kind of cool. We got to see him uh, two weeks ago down in San Diego and uh, he did not sign my book. So I was very upset. <laughs> um, you did have a little bit of a fanboy moment though. I did. I was chasing him. I liked it. Looked like an idiot. <laughs> hey, Mark, remember me? Remember me? <laughs> anyway. But we got, and I also touched Gino Wickman too, which is a little, little fan fanboy moment. Um, anyway, the book is pretty good. I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, some of the book here, and uh, we'll be pausing. Uh, if anybody has bought the book or seen the book, uh, there's some really good reflection questions in each chapter. So we're going to pause and and have those conversations uh, as we go through the the material. So um, first off, uh, welcome to the to the club. Please uh, recognize that we have been doing this every quarter and that they are all available to you on YouTube. So if anybody wants to go back and check out our library, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. So here's the agenda for this club. Um, we're going to focus on the first four chapters, which here I've identified five, but Choosing to truly transform did not make the cut. Um, we have way too many slides for the first four chapters, so we're going to stay focused on on those. We'll add that fifth one to the rest, the remaining portion of the book. Um, so uh, briefly here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to go forward with this and uh, feel free to raise your hand, ask a question. Charlie's going to kind of uh, pounce on me or Aisha. Somebody's going to tell me that, hey, somebody has a question. But when we get to the reflection questions, that's really when we're going to have time to to speak. So um, with that being said, uh, the book starts with a forward, and I thought this was worth mentioning. Um, there's a concept that Anise Kavanaugh, who is a leadership people consultant, um, she has this concept called intentional energetic presence, which is IEP. and um, uh, what what that consists of is, you know, we have uh, we're in leadership mode all the time uh, with our businesses, whether we're an, an employee or an owner. And so um, you may have a specific way that you approach your employees. Um, and what she says is try to get to an IEP where you have both these key points, which is another process that you do. Um, checklists, tools, initiatives, um, but also a way of being and thinking that you become. So you're going to be who you do, like who you are today with your systems, and then uh, you need to be thinking in terms of uh, what you're going to become. So anybody who's ever worked with values or vision will kind of know what that means. It means you're always kind of bringing it up. You're starting to embody kind of a future speak about your business. So both are important um, impacts on your message and your people understanding. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, I'll probably pull out that, uh, see if she's written anything or check her website out. 
So first chapter, we're going to get into chaos or intentional culture. This is a really neat little grid. I've never seen it before. I really got this book and expected it to be very regurgitated EOS um, stuff. Anybody's read traction and there is quite a bit in there, but there's also some other uh, goodies. So he, right off the bat, they do mention EOS um, and they talk about like what motivates you to use it, right? So why would you use it? What is what am what am I trying? Why would I bother with this? And um, they kind of summed it all up from a survey where the majority of the responses were was this response. I'm not getting enough out of my people. We weren't all on the same page. We weren't working together to win, right? So it's this idea of everybody going the same direction that was the impetus for both this book as well as uh, why people use EOS. So I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, let's see. So starts here and we'll hit the pause button and ask a question. So let's think about your business for a second. And we got Derek, Haley, we got Ruth. I'm afraid to hear what Ruth has to say here. So <laughs> I'm going to let Ruth answer instead of Charlie, unless Ruth is not available to speak. But um, what quadrant are you? So this is looking at your culture and there's intentionality on the left, which means you're being you're intending it to go a certain direction. Um, unfortunately, it can fall into two spots, one unhealthy and the other one healthy, and that's what you're seeing on the bottom. So to be unhealthy would mean that you've got a uh, domineering leader <laughs> who might um, command and control um, and not work with the leadership's team, not work with the employees or provide the opportunity for everyone to thrive, right? Um, so that's intentionality but not being healthy and then um to be intentional but be healthy is really where you want to go which is called an intentional culture um it means that uh you've opened up and you're creating this environment dare to build an intentional culture right is the name of this book um and then if you're not healthy and not intentional that's chaotic and i've certainly been involved in those even at the highest level and then i've had healthy in environments I've been part of that are not intentional. And that's what they call a happy accident. So with that being said, um, Haley, wh where where do you see yourself on the evolution of this quadrant um, di diagram? Yeah, I think we are probably a blend, but for a long time, I think we were happy accident. And then we slip into chaotic culture and then we, you know, that's if it's fluid. Then we fluid, try to be right? more intentional <laughs> and, you know. Well, and, and just for the record, how many employees are you guys at this point? 135-ish. 135, oh. right? So very difficult to uh, try to pull that culture through. You might get it at the leadership level, but then to even take it down from there. So right, let's get some other. Mm -hmm. Oh, what's that? Oh, just store to store. Yeah, so that's why it's hard to answer. Some stores probably are better than others, so. Correct, and that's the other part is you're not in one central location. So, holy cow, right? That's a challenge to try to get that message across. Um, how about Derek? What's your business look like with regard to this grid? Uh, well, Haley's my boss, so I'm going to just go with whatever she said. Uh, <laughs> you should ask Derek first. <laughs> oh, no. Derek's with my HR, Dan. Yeah, uh, all right. I should have yeah. went to Derek. Now in the future, I know to do that. So we're cool. <laughs> no, actually, I got, I got. It's me and Brian. Brian's our operations, our VP of operations. So I, I kind of agree with Haley. I think happy accident was what we, what we landed on a few years ago, and then yeah, um, things get chaotic. Then we try to fix things, and yeah. But I definitely don't think we have any kind of command and control. I think um, obviously we have a leadership team, but it's very open and honest, and communication is open. So. Got it. Awesome. OK, let's try uh, one of our newest members, Ann. And how about your company? Well, you guys are smaller, right, Ann? You've got a few people. Give me a second. She just joined. I got to click her microphone. Oh, OK, sorry. Go. And Carrie just joined. How about yeah, Ruth? Do hers too. Can we get Ruth? Yeah, give me a second. 
I'm here. Yeah, Ruth's good. Ruth, Ruth, how do you feel about our culture at uh, peer executive groups? Where are we where are we sitting right now? Well, I think we have an intentional culture, but it's taken a while to get there. So I can remember uh, six years ago when I started working with you, Dan, there um, you sent me some of the uh, culture and vision and goals. And at that point, I didn't really see them in action, but that's not the case now. I definitely do. Nice. Good answer. Mm -hmm. High praise. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. Okay. And how about, uh, did we get Anne hooked up? I want to hear from Anne if I can. Yeah, she should be able to once she just, um, she just needs to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Can there you hear we me now? go. We can. All right. Uh, yeah, I would say our culture is definitely a chaotic culture. Nice. Okay. Not nice, but nice it's that you correct. recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> and how about Carrie? Is she unclicked? I don't know if you did. You give her. She's on mute. I think. Okay, cool. Yeah, she would have to unmute. I'm not going to ask Aisha. She's too new. She's going to give me a hard time. FYI for everybody, Aisha spends more time with me than anyone. She's my uh, assistant working and also our, one of our new sales coordinators. So, <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hi. All right. Well, with that, we can move on to the next slide because there's plenty more. So this is what we're talking about, really. Um, intentional culture is that we're rowing in the same direction, and we're going to talk about human energy model at some point. Um, but I will say that uh, all of these are survivable, right? I can tell you I have loved being in a chaotic culture at times, which is, sounds really sick. but um, it's uh, it's not fun to be unproductive. So let me take that part out of it. But we were uh, I've I've run and gun in some organizations that were just crazy, and we had to get to intentionality, right? I found that that to me, and they don't cover this in the book, but to me, it was you went up to command and control and let somebody with the iron fist take control of things, um, and then you kind of slipped over to intentional culture. Um, that's what I've experienced. Um, I have certainly been in a happy accident before, and I feel that peer groups is healthy, but either somewhere between happy accident and intentional. So, you know, I, I, oh, you're, you're, um, you have to, we, we ride that wave between intentional and happy accident. <laughs> So we just had our quarterly pulse, which is something you'll learn about. And um, I got a list super long from the uh, employees at the onset of the of the quarterly uh, pulse. So that gave me a sense of we're still kind of happy accident going up to intentional or we're command and control trying to go over. So either way, one of those things we're working on. OK, so. Oop, human energy model, uh, it is what it looks like, so it's everyone rowing in the same direction. They use an image in the book of these arrows all going different directions. And as you grow and as you get bigger, and I'm thinking of Haley being over 125 employees, um, you get more and more arrows going different directions on different topics inside your company. So it's super hard to stay on top of that and just to try to get the arrows all swim in the same direction, which the ro rowing in the same direction is kind of a concept for me. Um, at this point in the book, he kind of moves into, and I say he, but to be honest with you, CJ Doobie might have been very active. Kelly is Kelly Knight, I think, is more of a writer, but CJ Doobie uh, is someone uh, from Minnesota, right? Charlie, we kind of we saw her speak at the uh, EOS conference. Yeah, I think the three of them that wrote this book are the leadership team for EOS. Oh gosh. That's cool. Because uh, Mark's the visionary, Kelly's the um, uh, integrator, and CJ is the implementer. Do I have that right, oh. or is it the other oh. way around? I forget. I have no idea. That's, yeah. I didn't really know that. Okay, cool. Yeah, one, that cool. one seminar that I went to that was like the behind the scenes of EOS was the three oh. of them. 
Yeah, by the way, that's on demand and uh, if we'll have to look into if we can provide some videos for our members um, or something that they can see. So key items from EOS, um, they mentioned these right off the bat, so I want to capture it. Uh, the concept of right people in the right seats um, is something that we'll get in and out of uh, throughout this period. And then uh, the accountability chart, which really focuses on some key duties per uh, role on the chart. And then um, six key components which make up traction, really. So uh, these are not in any particular order, but I always look at it from a vision standpoint first. Um, and we look at um, the people side of the business, uh, which is pretty quickly goes into accountability. Um, and then we look at data, um, process, issues, and traction. So those are some things that they want to unload on you in the beginning uh, because they're going to call upon it later on. Just so you know, right people, right seats. Does anybody volunteer want to explain what that is? Charlie, why don't you tell us? <laughs> you got the right people on the bus and they're in the right positions. Okay. Versus the wrong people in the wrong seat or um, the wrong person in the right seat. Good. good. What's GWC? Uh, get it wanted and capacity to do it. Got it. All right. So knowing uh, that they have the mental capacity, physical capacity, and there's another one. Emotional, emotional capacity. Um, emotional you know. capacity. Yep. Yep. So. Uh, they talk about the antidote to a dysfunctional culture. So if you have a dysfunctional culture or you're trying to start moving their direction, this is a good, uh, these are some good things to know. And I just, I liked, when I read a book, I like to, I'm going to, I was going to lie and say, I like to take notes because I don't like to take notes. But <laughs> when I read a book, I like to take like any of the headlines that I see uh, that are going to cover a couple of paragraphs and these were some of them. So if you want a more productive and happier workplace, have courage and dare to build an intentional culture. And they get into courage quite a bit in this book. Um, they want everybody to recognize that culture is not a thin layer on top of the business and it's not an add on. So um, I think when you talk about values, culture, things like that, people feel like it's the soft underbelly of a business, but it actually can be at the forefront of, of who you are as a company. All right, so what does it take to get to an intentional culture? Setting it up right up front. Number one, be intentional, which they like to say, hey, there's this great book traction and there's eight steps to being, uh, that if you go through these eight steps, you're being intentional. We're gonna cover that later. Uh, but essentially, uh, for those of you who know EOS and Traction, it's this idea of creating a vision, uh, VTO, and then moving to um, structured meetings and, and um, lo learning how to um, identify, discuss, and solve issues in your company. So that's kind of this, this idea of like, let's build some structure around this. Um, the number two foundational concept was courage matters, which we're going to talk about. And the other one is invest the time, the money, which I was interested in. Um, I have a tendency to not invest the time. So uh, there might be money spent at peer groups, but we, but we don't have that much time. So we just kind of move. Right. So that's a, I learned that if I really want this thing to be intentional, I've got to take a step back, build the processes or build out the processes behind it. Right. And then the last part is the payoff, which is the EOS life, um, which we'll talk about. But they've kind of taken that new concept. Gina Wickman left uh, the company. He wrote a book called The EOS Life. It really is kind of designing the lifestyle for the owner as they exit. So that's the idea behind having an intentional culture. So this is the EOS life piece, uh, just so you know. Um, you want to be doing what you love, and this could be anybody, any position in any company, right? I have this conversation with employees. I have this conversation with uh, friends who are in business. So are you doing what you love with people you love? Are you making a difference, a huge difference? Um, are you being compensated appropriately and with time for other passions? 
So if you think about it, you could scorecard yourself on this, right? You could say on a scale of one to five, here's where I'm at. Um, you know, I think that uh, Ruth has time for other passions right now, but I'd like her to do more work. So <laughs> take away one of those. She'll, she'll come de back down from a five to a two. But um, but anyway, so that's the idea behind this. I highly recommend. I know in our company, we spent a lot of time discussing what you need as an employee. What can we do for you? Um, and it really, I think, helps the culture. Any comments on the EOS life in your business? I was on a call earlier this morning with a company and that this was kind of the, the gist of it that I was giving them is like the idea is, is that we build out a structure that you can walk away from and runs without you there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's at the high level, but also on the lower levels, uh, we get into management and roles and people, what people, what really floats people's boats. What do they enjoy doing? Yeah. So that kind of ends chapter one. And these are some reflection questions. So we'll kind of ask these questions out to the group. Um, number one, <laughs> this is a horrible question. It's a yes or no. So I guess by a show of hands, click your raise your hand if you feel that your current culture is holding you back from getting what you want from your business. There's Anne. Right. I think Anne raised we, a hand there. We got one. All right, cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the rest of you can leave. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, next one. Are you willing to take responsibility for creating and leading every aspect of your culture? And that doesn't mean delegating to human resources. So that one, a um, couple people there. So uh, anybody who sat through my fourth quarter book club, Execution, uh, that was a book that came out about 20 years ago. Um, one of the things they say a CEO should never give up is the oversight on human resources at the highest level. So I think it's interesting to see that continue to carry through because until I read that book last quarter uh, or yeah, it was no two quarters ago, I didn't really um, I didn't think like that at all. So um, and then the last one is, are you willing to do what it takes to become your best and demand the best? from yourself and your company and make all the necessary tough decisions that one's kind of uh it's a little puffy but uh, i need i need a sideways thumb for that one yeah sideways <laughs> yeah i'm not sure i'm ready for that but you know here we go okay two more do do you believe you and your team deserve a culture that wins in any environment and economy interesting I would hope to see a thumb there, so that's good. Yeah. Um, are you willing and have the courage to be open, honest, and vulnerable to build an intentional and enduring culture? So that one's interesting. So that one has a lot to do with courage and also vulnerability, which we'll talk about going forward. Um, definitely a tough one for me. I'm not that type of person, but I would love to be. So moving in that direction, I think, build in some systems. Um, we can talk about what that looks like for you and your company uh, to to have those types of things pop up in your company. All right. Next up, analyzing your culture, which way is it pointed? Oh, this is the name of the second chapter. What's love got to do with it? <laughs> they went, they did a reverse. music reference for you. Yeah, I know, right? I'm going to write a book and just have the chapter titles be records, music, <laughs> music, songs. So here's here's the intentional versus the command one that we talked about at the top of the grid. Um, and you could kind of see what I mean when I was sharing with you about like how I've been in environments <laughs> where scarcity and fear have pulled people. It's intentional. It's pulling you the right direction, right? not a place you're going to last right it's not a long-term view for anybody um i was part of a company a startup where they formed the company as i sold a company to this company and we were given a hundred million dollars to spend in 12 months 
and we had to spend a hundred million dollars in 12 months and i was 30 years old and so scarcity and fear was the only way we were going to get it done um i did leave after a year by the way so um and then abundance and love um is maybe a little slower right a little you're going to slow it down be intentional uh non-urgent activity but ultimately plays the long ball we have a company right now looking at doing eos implementation and i think they are at year two of delaying their start because uh they they can't get a leadership team from their core leaders that um shares this con these concepts so it, it's very difficult we'll go into values at some point about that but but um you have to recognize right people on the bus for the type of company that you're going to be so optimism, positivity, collaboration, long-term views, those are all things that are typically not rushed. Um, being proactive is good. And then certainly um, the rest of it, contentment, gratitude, those things. So diagnosing your own culture, uh, it's this kind of concept that Oh, we're we're suck it up culture. So we have uh, a member in peer groups that was started in uh, 2019 and grew very quickly to 12 million, you know, and it was definitely a suck it up culture. It was like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Not for the faint of heart. And so they were um, really, really, really kind of counting on everybody having that mentality. Um, it didn't really work until they started to slow the bus down. And that's what um, changing that intentionality over um, because suck it up culture isn't brave. It just sucks. Right. So that was a cool quote in the uh, in that chapter. And so uh, putting the love in it uh, in the in the company, it's not just knowledge and competence. It's not just process improvement, but understanding how to document and systematize empathy and compassion. So I'll pause right there. Does anyone have an example of making a transition? And for anybody who's implementing traction, you probably have an example, but um, does anybody have an example of trying to add empathy and compassion to the company? Otherwise, Charlie's gonna answer it. <laughs> no pressure. That's hard because like, I mean, when I hear traction and EOS, like I think systems and data and cold's not the right word, but like very um, systematic. And when I hear empathy and compassion, like that's more like warm and um, actually the, the, um, uh, one of the ladies in a consulting thing that I did this past weekend was talking about the warm and squishy, right? Like that's kind of like the, the, the warmer side of it. So I have a hard time like putting the two together. So, so just for you, your guys' knowledge, Charlie did a rental leaders boot camp for non-owners. Um, and one of the things they go through is behavioral profiling, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So Part of that is it has to do with consideration and understanding for different behaviors. Mm -hmm. So if if that becomes part of your company, if you start to evaluate um, or or help with a communication device by studying behavioral pro, uh, analysis, that could be an example. Um, yeah. I would also say any kind of recognition or celebration could right. also be considered empathy and compassion, right? Yeah. At least this is, and by the way, this is my version, right? So this is not in the book. So whatever you guys think, but but I do believe that you can systematize empathy and compassion. As so here, part here's of, my here's my oh there you go compassion right here the golden banana. So we want you want to explain what that golden banana is? Like uh, employee of the quarter, right? <laughs> the one that goes above and beyond. That's Dan's recognition. So we were in New Orleans at the ARA show and and we were imbibing probably a little too much. And, and actually, Charlie, I think it was right on the show floor. I don't Charlie think was, was trying any, to say any extras involved. Charlie was trying to say like recognition for greatness, you know, in the in the business. We have Top Gun as a way to recognize our peer group members. And um, 
I said, oh, yeah, like the golden banana. And he just starts <laughs> laughing. And he's like, never heard this phrase. And I'm like, no, no, it's a thing. It's a thing. So I was vindicated because if you do Google search golden banana, I think it's supposed to be top banana, but golden banana showed up. Yeah. So Charlie won the first quarter and Zoe had to ship a uh, six pound golden banana to him. <laughs> Dan, I'm, right. I'll chime in on that, too. I think yeah. sometimes when you have a company that's first starting EOS and you have the visionary and then you're looking for the implementer, yeah. often the visionary isn't the person that is that warm, compassionate kind. Yeah. And so what they're looking for um, is someone to offset that when they choose their uh, implementer. implementer. That's that's a good point. It could be a compliment, right? We uh, mm -hmm. we know there's a book out there called Rocket Fuel that tries to get very descriptive with complementary uh, people working together um, to to make things happen, right? So so they talk about what heart centered leadership looks like, and um, these are just some of the paragraphs that were addressed. Uh, we'll come back to greater good, but love is a verb, right? It's an action versus a thing um, greater good has to do with a lot of things, but ultimately making decisions that are going to benefit more than less. Um, and being able to identify genuine care and concern for people, um, being authentic as you're interacting with the people in your organization and human creative power, which we'll talk about. So to me, I'm a fan of e-myth and e-myth is the most systemic way to get your business to run without you right it's it's basically mcdonaldizing everything but one of the concepts they talk about is tangible versus intangible indicators so for example you might say um our company is a hundred percent focused on greater good and a hundred percent of all decisions are made for the greater good or zero percent of our decisions are made for the greater good and um and so this is an intangible range so you could score at 75 right that gives you a score of 75 for greater good in your company so you could technically take each of these and make them um something that you would score intangibly and try to improve so inside eos we do a thing called the organizational checkup and we use a tool called 90IO, uh, which has changed their checkups a little different. But there's these, these kind of intangible scoring around the success of communicating EOS concepts and vision to your employees. Um, so I highly recommend that you, you look uh, for ways to um, put some kind of tangibility into these pieces to know that you're moving the right direction with being intentional with your culture, right? Um, so any questions about that slide? Again, second chapter, very much uh, different. So here's this is where the greater good, I want to expand on that particular one. So I thought it was really cool. We talk about EOS and we talk about the implementation of Vision Traction Organizer. Um, they're basically saying the greater good for your company means you're committed to the vision traction organizer but that you uh, multiply it by genuine care and concern and that gives you the end result of intentional culture so i like that that thought like that picture in my head about what that might be um and they get into relational decisions versus transactional um uh when it comes to your employees your customers and what how that looks different and then lastly, authenticity, right? Being who you say you are um, and making sure that your values are who you are, not who you want to be, which we'll talk about in a minute. So with that, I'm gonna pause. Um, I guess my question is, I know Haley and Derek are implementing EOS. Um, I think Ann has not, but Ann got the traction book in the mail yet? She may have gotten the, the book. No, I haven't received it yet, but I believe okay. I have a copy of it. Oh, wow. Look at that. She's on the spot. She didn't have to wait for peer groups to give her one. Excellent. And then, um, and Ruth, you've obviously read the book or at least, you know, implemented yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. cool.
All right. So human creative power, I'm going to go back to that because you may have never heard that phrase. So human creative power says our company values the uniqueness of the individual. And this is a stretch, but, you know, we work with you on your personal core focus, or at least we encourage it. So, um, you know, Haley, you guys have done annual planning with your leadership team and you have done some quarterly pulsing with your with your leadership team have you guys ever addressed personal core focus which i can You're get giving into us more credit than we we have not done those things very formally i mean we annual okay. plan and use a vto so sorry i'm not a great no problem so so charlie and and aisha um we had our quarterly uh charlie what would you consider what we did in the last quarterly would be down this path of kind of personal core focus or any exercises you've done with peer groups with us as a company that kind of focused on you and not on the company oh uh how about that one that you did that was like your li the lifeline exercise okay. where you put like um major milestones in your life on a on like a timeline that was yep. one that kind of focused more on us as people versus um, the business. Yeah, so that that the intention there is to say, I'm going to have a moment to share with you key points in my life when I was at my high and my low. And then at the end, the idea was to say, this is where I'm going to go uh, in my future. And I hope that it aligns with peer groups, right? That yeah. kind of thing. Um, another one we did was identifying um, uh, goals for the year. So we had personal goal setting. Um, I do annual planning as well as quarterly pulsing with about, I mean, we we have probably eight that we support, eight rental operations. Um, but I had one group did a, um, a business, uh, or I should say personal goal setting. And so that was cool to see what they came up with. There's like five leaders in that company. Um, this one is personal core focus. We'll probably do this at some point, Charlie. So you make a laundry list of your activities, what you typically do. You look backwards a month. You say, what did I do this month in my job, outside my job, whatever it might be. You want to move it to this delegate and elevate tool, which is a grid which says, this is what I love and I'm good at. This is what I love, but I'm not good at. And then this is stuff I don't love, but I happen to be good at and stuff that I don't love, but I'm not good at, right? You put it into the grid. And um, from that, you start to discover your passions and strengths. So we make a list of passions. We make a list of strengths. And then you've done the work. Now you want to kind of create your mission, your mission statement, your who you are, your personal core focus, what what floats your boat, um, you know, and you start to write that up. One of the things we did in our quarterly um, last week was we talked about have you ever had an aha moment? So a uh, number of our um, leadership team shared, you know, that they had an aha moment in their past and it's changed the direction of where they've headed or something like that. Right. Or they said we didn't I didn't have one yet. So either way. In my case, or you have one and it keeps you on the path that you're on. Correct. Go ahead, Ruth. No, I just uh, was thinking about when you said that you haven't had one yet. Yeah, I haven't had an aha moment. <laughs> I don't believe that, right. but okay. <laughs> right? Because he's had like six. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I just, um, where'd it go? I have a newsletter here. Oh, I got share. So I found this newsletter. You can see that young boy in the corner there. This was my first that. company. It was called Polaris and it was True North. And this is my first newsletter from 24 years ago. And if you look at it, it's like, welcome to Emith Mastery and Pol Polaris Performance Partners. So it was peer groups back in 2000. Let our experience be your guide. What's the value of my business? Do, do you have a manager with the right stuff? How does that work? You know, how do you develop your leadership team? So I'm doing the same thing, but that was an aha moment, right? 
I thought it was cool I found that. Um, that is. So you create your personal core focus, then you go through the last two steps, which is delegate, automate, eliminate. Not every employee can do this, but you can always keep your true north. I'm going to steal that. Keep your true north of where you want to go in your life and, you know, have those conversations uh, with your immediate supervisor. We in our company, we call it a quarterly conversation from traction. And then we continuously update. So it's important for me to know what the goals are of my employees and so forth and so forth and so forth, right? We want to take that all the way down. Any questions about that PCF? All right, let's go through some questions. And these are not yes, no. So if anybody wants to chime in, you can. Um, are are there areas of your company? So think about how your company is broken out. Do you have areas in your company where you're running from a place of scarcity and fear versus abundance and love? For me, it's very easy to know what those are because of my, which which sex which areas of the company are stronger than others. Um, but anyone what care to answer that? And you're you're a new owner, I believe, right? Yeah, she is. So she yes. she may so yes, she so you've got to fulfill the rental experience, but you also have to generate new work, new customers. Correct. Right. So uh, do you feel one of those areas is stronger than the other? Uh, in um, like a stronger need or 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 a strength. Strength, like better better suited. Um, probably, uh, new customers. New customers. Got it. So you're able to handle that and pull them through your vision for your, as a company, fulfill their needs and make them happy. Right. That kind of thing. Correct. Mm -hmm. But, but maybe not the same with existing expectations from previous customers or anything like that. I know if Haley goes out and I'm speaking for you, Haley, but if she goes out and acquires a business, right. She may have that. Uh, dilemma of trying to either catch up the cultures with each other, right? Sure, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. And you got 15 minutes left. Yes, yes. We're almost done, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, is your leadership team 100% on the same page with every word of your vision? That's interesting. So, think about that. Um, answer if you care or not. But um, Charlie, how do you feel about peer groups? Uh, I think our vision has too many words. <laughs> too many words. Ugh. Come on, that's what AI is all about. Exactly. <laughs> AI can make it very wordy. Yeah. Um, yes. I, I've put yeah. things in there and um, not been too happy with what the result has been. It's too much fluff. Yeah. And too formal. It is fascinating. I um one of the things Charlie's willing to compromise with me on all of this VTO that we're going to redo this summer is um, <laughs> he's letting me keep it off to the side in my back pocket, and then and then he's going to take and redo the VTO. And and this is how it works, Charlie. You go, can you use less words? You know, That's and what say I that say. to AI. AI will cut <laughs> yep. cut words out. Yep. And you can also tell it to use less formal language. And as you use it over and over again, it will it will tweak it. But yeah, we we totally don't use um, AI enough as a company. Um, do you and all leaders and managers demonstrate genuine care and concern for each of your people? Um, this is probably one of the biggest takeaways I w I've had out of the book. Um, you know, I'm reading this people book and it seems extremely simple. Um, seems extremely systems oriented but then you get into the meat and it's like whoa you know he's kind of trying to systematize what it means to care to have care and concern um and so i kind of like that very different never you know we they had a previous book called how to be a great boss and that was one of our book clubs and uh so there we learned how to lead and manage two separate things that bring about accountability but this was uh very different um, are there areas where you're either not acknowledging or holding back from leveraging 
individual unique talents. So I, I have to ask this question. Um, and Carrie Haley, Derek, you can answer. Um, is it? Uh, have you done a good? Do you feel like you've done a good job um, surveying the skill sets of your existing employees? Like you have a good feel for who does what well and who, you know, what they have in their bag of tricks. I don't know that we survey it necessarily, but we're pretty active in getting out to the stores almost every single day and just trying to talk with people and meet with people. Brian and I are definitely not um, bound to the office by any means. We we literally are out there every single day just talking to people got it and that that's two-way communication right so you're not just telling them the vision yeah exactly right. okay and that's i think key so for me i have a tendency to talk one way you're getting to experience that right now um but i think that i count on charlie um to be a listener more so than me even because we know that's a tough thing for me um i'm doing better and i think that's something i got to keep working on this is a great book to help me get there right so we'll move on so this is the fourth chapter in the final is this the third or the fourth to let charlie figure this out but anyway this <laughs> one it's going to be quick i so can real quick the here content for the best of them the, this is in structure first they want you to look at the eos process yeah so, you're in chapter three chapter three so we the they walk you through this and i totally going to send this PowerPoint out to about five people that I know right now because they do this 90 minute meeting and maybe even get through the focus day, but no one starts the process. Uh, they sit on it and they're like, oh, this looks like a lot. I'm not going to start. But they they share with you very basically, look, let's focus on the accountability chart first. Then we'll get into vision building and then we'll do the 90 day world. And uh, 90 day world to me is the whole secret sauce, right? I love it. So we'll just talk through it. So here's the accountability chart, what it looks like, pleasing versus serving, um, leadership seats, creative ways to navigate, and then a daring thought. So I'll walk you through it real quick. So right now, uh, and it looks like we haven't updated it, but um, these, these accountability charts should be looking 12 months from now, six to 12 months from now. Uh, so we need, looks like we need to update this, Charlie. But um, so as a visionary, I have uh, three to five roles that I want to be responsible for, accountable for, right, at the, at the highest level. Um, the integrator, which is also me, but really Charlie on some level, uh, Charlie is our EOS implementer, and he runs the show on that. Um, the process improvement lead and profit center support is we're probably going to come up with some new wording on what that looks like so if i really wanted to change like these ones i own so whether they come up here um and then charlie's down here doing uh operational stuff right coo type stuff um there's zoe who runs admin and she really handles all of the operations in the company when we get up and we go to work in the morning what we do every day is really dictated by Zoe. I'm on the sales and marketing side. So I just get uh, with Aisha and we do sales coordination, sales huddle every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, we're focused on selling insurance. We're focused on selling consulting. We're focused on bringing on new members and uh, vendor relationships for the peer group network. And then we have Jess on the back end. But so to me, that bottom piece, somebody's going to do sales. Somebody's going to be handling daily operations and somebody's going to be, um, you know, financial controls and reporting. So those are the big ones. Now, you might say, OK, well, where's Derek on here? Derek might be um, on the I've seen some people take this CFO piece or controller piece and make it about admin and then manage admin from that angle. Right. So the, every every one of yours are different. Um, Derek, where what does your accountability chart look like? Well, that's a good question. I think we're we're actually working on it right now. Um, okay. I think the conversation actually starts tomorrow. Oh, um, cool. Excellent. Yeah, there's a lot of information. If you guys have this book, uh, you can dig into chapter three and 
they kind of go through these over here, these bullet points on the left, which talks about like what is a proper seat on leadership. And uh, Charlie will tell you the first seminar I went to at the EOS conference, this guy pulled out 20 different versions of accountability <laughs> charts. And I was like, like my head was spinning by the time I left. It was a horrible presentation, but it was, you know, it was good for you, but I would have liked it because it would have been all kinds of examples and seeing different True. ideas and stuff. Right. Yeah, it was it was insane. I never saw anything like it, um, but creative ways to navigate in a daring thought. The idea with the daring thought is take everybody in the business and throw them over to the right hand side and just start scratching out the accountability chart that supports your processes. And uh, as long as you do that, you will then have to see if you have the right people in the right seats or, you know, as you move them over to it. Uh, the key is do not try to plan too far out. I think it should be an org chart of the future, but I, like I said, six to 12 months, uh, one person per seat for sure. Biggest problem we ever had in implementing EOS is when you put two uh, people on the same issue. Less is more. Um, completing the chart means going down. You saw some down arrows on those. Um, go to three to five rolls per seat and always look forward. Don't look backwards. So those are kind of the do's and don'ts. Uh, when you're filling the seats, now that you've got it built, you want to use GWC to find out if they are the right people. Do they get it? Do they want it? They have the capacity to do it. Nothing wrong with stretching some people. So the idea is 12 months from now, Will they be the GWC on that, right? Or do they have it? The GWC flow channel we're going to talk about in a minute. And then uh, people don't rise to the occasion. They sink to the lowest level of training and prep and also lowest level of processes that are documented. So just keep that in mind. So this is the, the GWC flow, uh, flow channel. So you have challenges as uh, you have the challenge go up. Um, and you have less skills, the more stress you're going to have. The more skills you have, um, you could become super, you could become bored because you're too skilled for the role, right? So this is as um, Aisha joined the company, we are trying to figure out, are we stressing her out or is she bored? Um, and we try to get her into the GWC flow with the activity. So within the first month, her role changed pretty drastically because we kind of figured out she would be bored so we better she's got the skill set let's give her more responsibility and move her up into that so i think it's the same thing with you as you look at your staffing nice little grid very useful okay so after you create the accountability chart are they is it you go around that chart and you say are these people really leaders or are they just the best salesperson the best hr person right do they have the ability to lead, uh, provide direction, and provide uh, uh, expectations for their people? Um, having a team of great people is not a solution. You want to validate the AC. We're not going to get into that right now. Uh, there's three steps to validate. You want to have courage for the journey, and it all starts with your leadership team. So these were the questions, and at this point now, I'm starting to write down answers to the questions as I go through the book. So you'll you'll find the same. By the way, I'm going to send you all this PowerPoint so you'll have it. Um, do you have the clear seats and roles um, that look forward 12 months out? Uh, there are three ways, three questions to validate the AC. And again, that'll be in here. I'll send it to you. Um, do you have a strong visionary integrator relationship in place? And um, uh, there's a, an area that they get into that says this is what a great leadership team looks like and they've got the attributes and then lastly you want to gauge your employees to see if they're in that gwc channel or if they're outside the channel experiencing boredom or stress uh, and then we get into uh, getting to the core of your culture this is chapter four and briefly i'm just gonna set the table for next time we get together um, to me, the biggest takeaway on this is you can't delegate your core values and you can't vote on your core values. So they have to come from a very small, tight unit inside your company. 
Um, and the biggest thing that I learned or I knew, but I knew was part of this chapter was identify people who you really like inside your company, who are making you proud, make you feel good about what you're doing and look at those attributes that they have and possibly adopt those as your values um, and test them out. I know that, um, you know, core values have been identified by Tate's. So you guys have yours already. You might be reviewing them. I don't know, but. Um, these are core value traps. I just wanted to say that um, uh, permission to play is is not good. Accidental is not good and aspirational is not good. So you don't want them to be about where you want to go. They have to be about who you are today with your best people. Um, I've seen this in action, by the way, and it's not pretty. So you want to be very careful about it. Um, and then they have guidelines for the process. Um, these are the last questions for today, and then we'll be completed. Um, so look at, have you done core values in your business? If you're not, definitely you know, reach out. Um, do, you, do any of your core values fall into the value traps? Now when I challenge Charlie to look at our core values and, and see if any of them fall in there. Um, also, you need to talk about it a lot. Like, I don't talk about core values every quarter, but we have, since December, we've had three people join us, and I don't know that they've gotten the core values speech, right? Um, but it has to be part of who you are, your common language. We actually promoted our core values with a testimonial from our peer group members with each one, and then we put it out on um, social media, had it kind of internalized. We just need to do a better job with that. Um, and then as you reflect on the core values, do you have any big issues around key people? And, and I see that all the time. And it's hard to make a decision to lose someone who is a productive employee, but just destroys the company culture, right? It's a bad apple in, in the mix. So that's it. Any questions? I want to be respectful of your time. I got to jump off. I got my blast call here. All right. Right now. Thanks, guys. Good to see you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank It'll you. be a couple weeks and we're going to do it again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care, guys. Bye.